some great uh, speaker lineup and session lineup here. Uh, so what we're going to be discussing uh, today is going to be uh, D365 FNO user licensing and trying to make it a little bit easier to understand not only what the licensing methodology looks like, but then uh, what you can do to actually uh, maybe save yourself some money on the licensing side. So um, jumping into this, a uh, little bit of background about myself. Um, my name is Alex Meyer. I work for a company called FastPath that does security audit, security audit and compliance work. Um, my contact information is there in the middle. I have a number of different blogs across the number of different Microsoft uh, areas, um, uh, specifically around FNO, but also uh, at uh, you know BC, um, Azure, Azure Portal, uh, Azure uh, DevOps, things like that. So uh, feel free to check that out um, in there. Um, like was mentioned, I do have Microsoft MVP and business apps uh, around my work and contributions and security and audit compliance and user licensing. Um, and I've spoken at a number of different conferences in the US and in Europe um, about that. So uh, jumping into what we're going to be uh, looking at today. Uh, first and foremost, uh, pull up an agenda here and kind of walk through, make sure I keep the chat up um, as well, just to keep an eye on that. Um, so the agenda we're going to be looking at today is going to be around, uh, first off, looking at the FNO security model. Um, and the reason for that uh, will be, um, uh, we'll, we'll address that as we walk through this, how licensing is tied to security within um, Dynamics AX and FNO, what licensing mechanisms are currently in place, um, both, both from an entry point and then privilege-based perspective, uh, what sort of reporting we can get to, both in the AOT um, and user interface, and then manual versus automated reporting um, with the Excel licensing file. So with that, um, we'll go ahead um, and as you if you have questions throughout this, feel free to um, uh, stop me or uh, post in the chat. And I'll be happy to answer those as well. So if we uh, go ahead and look at uh, the security model within FNO, um, if you've dealt with uh, Dynamics AX or FNO uh, security, right? This uh, diagram probably looks fairly familiar, uh, but it's role based security where users are at the top, they're assigned roles. Underneath those, you have duties and privileges. Um, roles can have you know, be assigned other roles. They can be assigned duties. They can be assigned privileges. Uh, but in a perfect world, right, you would have a user assigned a role. That role would be assigned a uh, list of duties. Those duties would then have privileges assigned. And then privileges would have your object assignment occurring underneath that, right? So you kind of have this hierarchy-based structure all the way down uh, from the user down to the object that they're assigned. Um, and there are a number of different object types at that level at the securable object level, right? Uh, menu items, tables, data and service operations. So that's kind of the overview from that perspective on from a high level. If we jump into this a little bit uh, more detailed, right? Normally you have your roles assigned to the users. Those are gonna be your broadest security layer. They're gonna represent a job function that you would perform, things like being an accountant, accounts payable, right? And then like I mentioned, they can be made up of any number of sub roles, dues or privileges. In the middle, you have your duties. Those are going to be that middle security layer. They're going to represent a general task that a user would perform. So things like approving a customer invoice, maintaining budget plans, things like that. And then they can be made up of any number of duty or privileges. At the privilege layer is where you're going to set your object access, right? So that's going to be your most granular layer of security assignment. Um, and they're going to represent a very specific job function, things like adding a bomb line, editing a customer, things like that. If we go over to the securable object side, all right, so these are the objects that you can actually assign. Uh, you can look at this and say, okay, well, um, you know, where where does this fall into the different objects that I can assign at the privilege level, right? So the first type we would be looking at would be your menu items, right? These are then further broken out into three different types. There's menu item displays, which are going to be linked to forms. So anytime you navigate to a form with an FNO, the security for that form is being uh, uh, determined based on the, your access to the menu item display that's driving that form. Uh, menu item output, right, is anytime you're performing a task and, an, and a report is generated, right? If you go and click on a button and a report is generated, that's a menu item output. And then a menu item action is anytime you're in the system and you actually click on a button and there's a task that's performing behind the scenes, things like posting a purchase order, journal entry, uh, cutting a check, things like that. So that's the first type. The second type is a uh, table which is actually going to refer to a SQL table. So when you set your create, read, update, and delete permission to that, you're actually setting the create, read, update permission to the actual SQL table behind the scenes. 
Um, the third type is going to be data entities. So data entities actually combine a number of SQL tables together, um, and those then will encapsulate a business concept. So things like purchase orders and users, right, that go across multiple tables to actually get that information. The, um, you can interact with those data entities from an external uh, source um, and not have to know the underlying table structure, right? So it's going to make that consumption and, and um, integration uh, to FNO a little bit easier. Uh, so they do allow those CRUD operations. So you can create, read, update, and delete against a data entity, and it doesn't really require any X++ knowledge while you do have to go and actually create the object um, in uh, X++, right? You don't have to actually write any code uh, behind that um, to, for it to be able to pull and, um, and uh, read that data. The last type is going to be the service operation, right? And this is going to be your public facing REST API that you can then also consume from external sources, but that's all that's going to require an X plus plus knowledge to create and then write what you actually want that um, that endpoint to actually do, right? So those are the different object types that exist within the system. So the question that um, then gets asked quite often then is, well, why did we why do we have to go through like a quick security overview when we're talking about licensing right what's the what's the reasoning behind that and the biggest case for this is the idea that licensing is going to be tied directly to security right so any changes that you make to security could impact licensing right and so that's where you have to understand how the security setup is working right to actually be able to uh, know and operate or be able to understand the licensing side of things and that makes it um AX and FNO are slightly unique in the ERP space, right? There are other systems, even within Microsoft, BC and CE, right, that don't have this licensing model where what you're assigned actually drives what licenses you have. Most of the time, the licenses that you're assigned will drive what you can actually do in the application, and that's not true within AX and FNO. Um, so there's some questions um, that I just rhetorical questions that you should probably start thinking about. Um, as we're walking through this, right? You know, what is your current process for determining user licensing, right? So, um, in most cases, um, unless a customer um, is looking at already looked at external solutions, right? This is a fairly manual process to perform, right? It's doing things through um, Excel outputs and trying to match up different things. So you're trying to um, do this uh, very, very manually. Um, the second question that we normally ask, right, is do security changes get analyzed for the licensing impact before they're implemented? And again, most of the time, if, uh, if customers don't have an external tool to help them with this, right, the question or the answer is really no, right? They just assign security and then worry about licensing later um, when that comes up for renewal, right? But in a perfect world, right, you would be wanting to do your license analysis uh, along with your security analysis, right, when you're making those changes uh, from that. Um, the third question is, you know, do you perform any sort of license analysis to see if you can reduce costs? Um, and again, most cases, uh, customers may try to go through this, but again, it's such a manual process. Um, if you're using native out of the box tools, that it, that can be very daunting. And then, um, you know, the last one. Normally, if you ask these in person, right, we can get a show of hands. But, um, you know, what if you do have that process in place, right, or if you're thinking through it, right, what? In this case, when, you know, we can think about what's the time frame that you're actually um, having to perform this, right? So if you're going to do a license analysis in Q1 of this year, um, right, when do you have to actually start that process for it to be completed then, right? So what's the, the lead time behind that, right? So um, there's a couple different uh, things that you want to start thinking about as we walk through this um, and trying to figure out what we can do to improve that. So when we look at um, the licensing model that um, it currently or exists within FNO, we kind of have to do a little history lesson behind this. So, uh, if you purchased your FNO instance pre October 2019, or if you've renewed before then um, and you haven't renewed since, right, this is the licensing model that you're probably currently on, right? You have this idea of your Dynamics 365 plan at the top. You have then underneath that the ability to then purchase a customer engagement plan or a unified operations plan, right? That would then give you access to everything within those uh, systems. But you had the ability, uh, at least initially, to buy that license that would go across both customer engagement and unified ops. Um, and then, of course, you underneath these, right, you had your uh, activity and team member licenses as well, right? So this is what you initially uh, could purchase from as part of your FNO or um, 
uh, the license plans uh, are that existed, right? So if you haven't gone through your renewal yet uh, since October 2019, right, this is still the licensing model that you're currently on. If we jump to the new licensing model, um, and this uh, these pictures are both pulled directly from the Microsoft uh, licensing guide that gets put out sporadically throughout the year. Um, so this is this isn't from the newest April one, but it, in this case it'll suffice for what we're trying to show. But you can see that your Dynamics 365 plan um, goes away, right? You don't have the ability to purchase that to go across customer engagement and FNO anymore. And instead, um, and you don't have the ability to buy just customer engagement or finance uh, FinOps plan, right? Either you actually have to go in and select which modules within each system that you would like to purchase, right? And so it makes it a little bit more difficult, right? Because you can't just say, well, I just, I'll just get them a, you know, a Dynamics 365 plan and I'll have access to whatever they, they need to within the system. Now you kind of have to start thinking about, okay, which modules are they wanting to uh, utilize? And then uh, what license combinations do they actually need? Um, and so that kind of leads into the uh, the next slide as well, where we start talking about base and attach. So when you start looking at these uh, licenses, right, it may you may come in and say, okay, well, I need a user that's going to be able to access finance and then also supply chain management, right? So there's a the potential where users may have to perform multiple tasks in here. And so how do I actually go about performing that? And so the idea is that um, you're actually going to be able to go in and purchase a a base license, right? That is going to be the license that this user um, is defaulted with, and then you can attach other licenses to it at a reduced cost, right? So um, your initial license may cost uh, for the finance, for example, may cost $180 a month, and then you can attach your supply chain and retail at $30 a month extra, right? Or whatever agreement you have with Microsoft, um, right? To actually um, satisfy that particular user license requirements. So uh, again, in the, the Microsoft licensing guide, you have this handy chart that kind of shows what your basin and attach combinations um, that are available, right? So which ones are valid? Because you can't, not every license can be a base and not every license uh, can be an attach. Sometimes there's, um, you know, dependencies on which can be assigned where. And so this is where um, tables like this come into play where you can actually see, OK, well, if I need a finance, for example, license, right, I can attach that to almost everything except for um, the, the RA license there. So uh, but you can kind of go across and try to see what that uh, kind of looks like um, as you go through this. So um, I know that was thrown a lot at you. So let's take a step back and look at what the actual licensing mechanisms in this case are, right? So. Um, how do you actually determine what license requirements are uh, within a particular uh, forward user, a role due to your privilege, right, within your environment, right? What's the actual license requirements? And so there's two real uh, licensing mechanisms that are in play. There's one that was historic, that has been around for a while, that'd be the entry point based licensing. And then there's the new privilege based licensing. Uh, that is uh, being added or the, it was added in October of 2019 and has kind of been in a constant state of um, upgrade or uh, in flux ever since then uh, on, on what that actually means. But those two mechanisms are what are actually being utilized within this particular um, within a, an FNO instance. And so if we look at the entry point based licensing and if anybody has looked at licensing in AX 2012, right, this should look somewhat familiar um, or if they've listened to me talk before. Uh, but there's really three license types within FNO from an entry point based licensing perspective. You have your operations at the highest level, right? And you have your activity underneath that and then a team member. So again, these are hierarchy based from operations being the, the greatest license down to team member being the least. Um, and so the idea would be from that side, and we kind of go into this a little bit more um, on the next slide, uh, but the idea is based on your access to the entry point will actually dictate which license you actually require to have, right? So that idea is fairly um, straightforward. Um, obviously, it gets much more complex as you have multiple, you know, privileges, duties, and roles being assigned to the user and trying to figure out which licenses are going to be required for that user. Uh, but that's the underlying principle there. From the privilege-based licensing side, 
uh, what this does is it actually breaks out your operations level license into a couple of different SKUs. So you uh, may have seen in the previous chart or graph that we were looking at, right, that you had your finance license, supply chain management, commerce and project operations, right? So what this is doing is saying, uh, instead of just buying an operations license, I'm gonna actually break this out into these four different parts uh, or modules, right? And then uh, depending on which uh, modules that user has access to will dictate which uh, licenses they are required to have. Um, and so again, the, uh, like I mentioned previously, if a user is going to require multiple licenses, then the additional licenses can be attached to that base license um, at a reduced rate, and the user must be assigned a base license before any attached can be used, right? So you can't just say, well, this is G these are all just going to be attached licenses, right, for this user. Um, but the idea for, for this side, and we'll get into this again um, in the next couple slides, is that the privilege-based licensing is actually going to be based, like the name implies, at the privilege level. So Microsoft actually designates certain privileges within your environment to tie to these particular license types. And if a user is assigned to that privilege, then they require that license, right? So um, we basically have to now go in and kind of marry these two ideas together, right? To actually determine what uh, license requirements are gonna be. In the next couple slides here, we'll actually uh, walk through uh, what, that, what that kind of looks like. So with that, I'm going to, I know I've seen a couple questions come across, so uh, we'll uh, take a second here to see what these, uh, what questions are. So are there any tools that can assist with reporting the forms, objects, et cetera, a user consumes? Uh, Scott, that's a great question. Um, so there's a couple different ways to take that. Um, if there's definitely tools to help to determine which, uh, you know, entry points and, and things like that a user is assigned to, um, as far as the consumption of that, uh, that would require some telemetry data from Microsoft, which is in the pipeline. Um, I don't have a GA date for that yet, uh, but once uh, you know we get access to that, I'm, I'm sure that there would be um, ISVs, including FastPath, that would take that into account to actually show what uh, uh, is being utilized that by a particular user, right? So um, from the assigned side, yes, there are absolutely tools and, and we actually, I actually talk about a couple uh, later on to show some reports to help with that. Um, from the actual consume side, right? Um, that's gonna require some telemetry data from Microsoft to actually uh, see that. Um, uh, ba -da -ba -da is there any news about the licensing enforcement? <laughs> uh, that is a, a great question as well. That's been kind of kicked down the road a little bit. Um, so for those that may not know, all of this is predicated on the fact that Microsoft would like to eventually uh, enforce this, right? So they would want to actually enforce that the licenses um, are that you're assigning the user are correct, right? Up until this point, and um, it's kind of been on an on your honor system, right? And then if you get audited by Microsoft, that's a separate question, uh, but, um, Licensing enforcement uh, is the only way that that can become uh, activated is if Microsoft can actually uh, determine or have the correct reports to say what this user should be assigned. Um, and they aren't there yet. Um, there Again, there are other tools, and I actually am a lead developer on one that will help you get to that. But um, as far as Microsoft is concerned, um, there is not any uh, immediate news on the enforcement side of this yet. Uh, yeah, uh, Nicola said that the system administration module is having several queries to help with the reporting side uh, from the what what is currently assigned, and that's actually um, we'll get to that and and uh, we'll show those reports later on. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, someone made a point here that their Microsoft um, does do more license compliance checking uh, now. Um, that is that is true. Now that they have more telemetry data, right? Um, there's more. Uh, it's easier for Microsoft to come in and do the license assessments uh, or license um, 
audits than it was in the past. Uh, so absolutely, uh, Microsoft does have the data. It's more of a question of do they actually want to enforce it? And I think they need to get in a better place of actually reporting on it uh, for them to be able to do that um, on a more frequent basis. But all good questions so far. Um, so we'll actually go in um, and jump into entry point based licensing um, and actually showing and breaking these these two different license licensing mechanisms down and showing how they actually uh, operate. All right, so for the entry point based licensing, um, like way I mentioned previously, right? This is going to be based on your entry point based access to a particular menu item. So all menu items uh, displays outputs and actions will have two parameters on the actual object themselves. So one is going to be called maintain user license and one is going to be called view user license. Um, and like again, the name implies, if you have read access to this object, whatever license is going to be listed in your view user license parameter, right, is going to be required. Um, if you have create, update, or delete permission to that object, whatever's in the maintain user license is going to be required. So right. So um, if we look over at the example I have in these again are the uh, programmatic names for these, but the view user license is called universal, which is uh, equates to a team member license and the maintain user license is in uh, enterprise, which equates to an operations level license, right? So if you have, if you're looking at the sys user info detail menu item display, which is what we're looking at here and you have read permission to this uh, menu item, right? That's going to require a team member license. If you have create update or update or delete, that's going to require an operations level license, right? So, uh, Basically, when you're looking at the entry point based license and you look at all of the objects that a user will do your privileges assigned and look to see what's the greatest level of access that that user has um, or greatest uh, license requirement that that user has, right? Because as the last bullet point says here, it only takes one access at a higher license level for that user or role due to your privilege to require that higher le level license, right? So if you have 100 accesses, and 99 of them are at a team member license and one of them is at an operations license, right? That uh, object or that role due to your privilege, right? Requires that higher level license, that operations level license, right? So um, it can be very easy for security changes, right? That we're, that we're talking about here, right? To equate to uh, requiring higher license costs. So that's from the uh, entry point based side. The other side to this is the privilege based licensing that we talked about. Uh, and so again, Microsoft designates certain privileges to require a particular license type. Um, and so the associations for the license to or the privilege to the license assignment um, is going to be found in the licensing service plans privilege table. Um, so if you have a development environment, right, you can go and run a query against this and actually see what those um, associations are. Um, the last piece of this is that you might notice that there is an is unique column on the right hand side that is unique uh, column is an additional piece that says whether or not this particular license is required to be assigned to this user so an is unique of zero means that any base license right uh, or any of the um, accepted base licenses for that uh, user type right um, could be assigned to that user so for example the line that's selected in the SQL query that I ran, uh, this finance level license here are the abbreviations entity maintain privilege, right? Is is unique of zero, which means that a user could basically be assigned any base license for that to satisfy the license requirements for this. It just needs to be assigned a base license. Uh, but for example, the accountant entity maintain privilege in this case, right, requires the finance license. So the finance license must be either a base or an attached license for that user, All right? So now we have to go in and look at the privileges that are assigned to the user and run that is unique um, value all the way down to see which combination of licenses does this user actually be uh, actually required to have. So taking this a step further, uh, there the question then becomes as well, how is the licensing service plans privilege table populated? Um, if we actually look in the code um, at how the uh, user license estimator report is generated, which is a report that actually Microsoft has to show this um, combination or show the license requirements for the user. Um, you can actually see that the this table is populated uh, via a JSON file stored in a DLL. So Microsoft has this JSON file that actually has the associations and as part of the process of generating 
the uh, user license estimator report, it populates that table, right? So um, as you can probably already guess, this puts a slightly limitation on um, things like um, if you create a custom privilege, right? Um, you know, how does that impact licensing? If you modify an out of the box privilege, right? What does that do to licensing, right? And all of these entire kind of questions that um, Microsoft is still trying to answer uh, from that side, right? Because if you go in and, for example, um, you know, modify one of the privileges that they've already designated as requiring a particular license type, right? Um, that can obviously impact the licensing requirements for that. Or if you create a custom privilege, right? And you assigned every object to that privilege, right? Um, all of a sudden, that's not in this list, right? So how, what license requirements did that have? So um, on the next slide here, I actually created a Visio diagram to uh, actually show the decision tree all the way down to actually show what this uh, kind of looks like, right? So, um, and again, these are, this uh, entire presentation is available on my blog. All of the information you're seeing on this is uh, going to be available as well um, on either blog posts that I have or in the PowerPoint. So um, you can absolutely um, find this afterwards as well. But the idea would be is that the first thing we need to, to do when we're actually determining what license a user requires is to see if any of the objects that a user is assigned uh, are actually at the operations level, right? If they are only assigned team member or activity licenses, uh, uh, objects based on their entry point and based licensing, right? Then that user is gonna require an activity or team member license, right? There's no additional steps we need to actually perform. If they are assigned an object at an operations level, right? We move into the next part of the tree here. And then we determine if that object is from a privilege that Microsoft has actually defined to require one of the new license SKUs. So we have to act, kind of work backwards and look at the privilege access to say, is this object in a privilege, right? That the, that, that users assigned um, that uh, would be, um, uh, that is part of the out of the box privileges that Microsoft has designated to require a particular license uh, requirements. If they're not, if it's a custom privilege or something uh, other than that, uh, a base license of any type is required, right? So the way that Microsoft is handling like custom privileges and things like that is that they're basically saying, hey, if you have a base license, that's going to suffice uh, the requirements there. If we move down, if we look at the that second level and say, yes, we're finding a privilege that's assigned to the user, um, then uh, that also exists in that Microsoft listing, right? Then we need to check to see if that privilege is set to is unique of true. Um, if the is unique is set to false, then again, any base license will suffice. If it says to true, then that license is required to use either a base or an attached license, right? So these are kind of the, the different steps as you work your way down to actually determine what that license requirement is. All right, so if we take a, um, if we start looking at the reporting that is available currently within FNO and how we can actually uh, see, start looking at what the um, requirements are from this case, right? Um, if we jump into the, the front end first, right? And we will go to the system administration, security configuration, select a role due to your privilege and go to view permissions, right? This is actually going to give us not only the entry point based licensing, but the also the license or the privilege based licensing as well. Uh, but it's slightly confusing on how they uh, report this. So just to point this out is that if you see, for example, on the way right side column here is the license um, uh, column on here, uh, you'll notice that it uh, has a combination of team member um, and finance, right? So what this means is that they're using that same column for both the entry point based licensing as well as the privilege based licensing. So if you see team member activity over here, that is referencing or um, associated to the actual resource or context, right? That object um, based on the entry point, that view user license or maintain user license parameter. If you see finance, supply chain management, retail, talent, uh, project operations in that license place, right? That's actually referencing the privilege, right? Because the privilege is where that particular license comes from. So just something to keep in mind as you're working through this um, and, and looking at this particular report. You can also, do uh, similar things, similar reporting here uh, from the uh, user license counts report, right? So again, if you go to system administration, inquiries, license, user license counts, 
right? Um, you're able to um, get that uh, information as well. One thing to note in this case, again, right, is this is going to look at um, just your entry point based licensing. So it's going to look at your team member activity and operations level licenses. Uh, so just to keep that in mind that the um, there are only very few reports within the system that actually include that uh, the privilege based licensing. So again, when we look at security role access, right? Report, which is another report that you can get to. This again is going to you'll see the operations moniker here. It's not going to break it out by your um, that privilege based licensing. So it's just going to show you that entry point based licensing side. So one of the reports uh, that that does show the privilege based licensing is the report that I mentioned earlier as far as the user license estimator report. Um, so this is going to give uh, again, be located in the system administration area, inquiries, license reports, user license estimator. Um, historically, um, in previous versions of, of FNO, there were a number of different bugs or issues with that report. Most of those have been addressed. There are still some overarching um, issues or gaps, and we talk about those in the next slide here that um, aren't addressed here. Uh, but the current licenses, as far as 10.0.25, our finance supply chain management commerce and project operations so when you run this report what happens is is that it it generates uh, uh, the actual data on the back end it takes a little bit of time and you're able to actually see this particular user is requiring the following licenses based on uh, those green dots that are filled in so um, you know that's kind of it just gives that high level information to say this user's required the this particular license um, it doesn't go any further as far as explaining why those licenses are required. Uh, so there, uh, like I mentioned, there are some gaps in the user license estimator uh, report. Um, you know, if you start modifying out of the box security access, right, especially if you're removing or adding access to one of the privileges that has been designated by Microsoft, right, that can absolutely have an impact um, to uh, you know the license requirements um, and especially the another one is the deny permissions and that's across the board um, the licensing reports don't take deny permissions into account so if you're denying uh, access for um, if you deny an object completely uh, it'll take it into account but if you deny um, just certain uh, access types on an object right uh, so an example would be like the um, Oh, I, I don't have one on the top of my head, but an entry point that would have operations level license at a maintain uh, user license level, but only have like a team member at a view user license, right? If you grant full control to that, but then deny the um, delete, update, and create, leaving effectively only read access, right? The license reports don't take that deny into account and still show that that user requires an enterprise or operations level license. So, um, that's something to keep in mind as well. Like was mentioned, it doesn't show why a user is requiring a particular license, right? So you can't go in and see, well, this license is coming from this privilege being assigned to the user or this object being assigned to the user, right? Um, it doesn't show base and attach options, right? So there are certain times that, you know, you can, um, you know, there are multiple ways that you can actually, in most cases, set up a user for, especially if they have multiple license requirements for base and attach. So it doesn't give you that option. Um, and again, it doesn't um, actually, this might have been addressed, uh, but it doesn't give you an easy way, I guess, to give a number of licenses of each license type required. So you have to do some manual accounting there. So in this case, right, what is the actual, the manual reporting options look like, right? So if you want to try to do this manually, how do you actually go about it? Um, obviously, you kind of follow that video diagram that I kind of talked about earlier. Um, needing to first determine what your user access is from the entry point based side, right? So whether whatever um, combination of reports you're actually using to get user access, going down to the entry point level, um, then determine the highest level of license required for that user based on that access. If it's team member activity, right, you're basically done at that point. If it's operations level license required, right, then you need to determine the privileges assigned to that user. And then you can reference data from the licensing service plans privilege table to determine the license or licenses required. Uh, and I actually do have two uh, reports that I are available. Sorry, let me pull these up here to help with this. Um, and I think. Um, I think this. 
think uh, I still should be showing here. So um, the, I created a couple of Excel documents. So those links in the PowerPoint will take you to these. Um, and what I've done is giving the ability to, oh, we can actually start in this one, um, go in and be able to see for each role, duty and privilege, the license uh, combinations that are going to be required to have. So um, basically automating the process of going into the view permissions uh, area um, and looking at that um, to help. The other part is that if you're upgrading from AX2012 to FNL, uh, right, this that upgrade process can be uh, a very manual process to try to determine what your license requirements are because there's not a one to one match for the licenses. Um, and so if you're still making that transition, right, I've created a, a Excel document here that kind of uh, at least gives you a starting point to say, here's where your roles, duties and privileges were at and objects were at in AX2012. Here's where they're going to in FNO and here's the license requirements across those, right? So those are available um, on those links that I provided uh, for you. All right, so this is the manual uh side of things right so um right uh if you want to go through it and do it yourself there are also automated solutions like i mentioned i'm a lead developer on one of these right so if you want to talk about a more uh automated process for this feel free to reach out after and be happy to uh to go into this a little bit a little bit more detail so when we talk about steps to actually um save some money right from a licensing cost uh, there are no, there are a couple different again options to help with this. Um, you need to uh, the one of the biggest things is ensuring that your current license assignments match your user requirements based on security, right? So you first need to make sure that your current license assignments actually match what your user security is. Um, the second part to that is looking for uh, if you can. Uh, get your user security correct, right? That'll go a long ways to actually validating that their, their licensing is correct, right? So if you can take at least a privilege approach to uh, assigning user access within FNL, right? That will also uh, be a way for you to uh, make sure that you're limiting the license requirements for that user, right? So you can kind of see where that, uh, that idea is. Uh, from that perspective, and again, you want to start um, as we talk about at FastPath all the time, taking a risk based approach to implementing this, right? So the idea here would be um, that you want to uh, look for places where their your uh, license requirements um, are the highest and start in those areas and say, do the users have need access in these areas? If they don't, right, you can start removing access. If they do, right, that user probably just needs that license um, associated to them. Or you could look at ways to maybe have another user do those particular processes, right, that already requires that license and offload that from another user, right? So there are a number of different ways you can go about actually um, utilizing this. And then um, you can look for, um, again, going back to the least privilege idea, looking for ways um, or instances where users or roles are over provisioned um, and either, you know, just straight up remove the offending access or create a new role with that correct security. You know, maybe you have uh, one role that you know is going to require an operations license for a particular task, uh, be it uh, you can, you know, separate off other parts to it um, to a lower level team member or activity level license, right? And and assign a majority of your users there instead of having one role that gives access to everything and everyone in that requires an operations level license, right? So if you can break off certain uh, lower cost um, uh, processes, right? That also helps um, in that particular uh, scenario. All right, so at the end of this, I left a, a little bit of time because normally the licensing piece has a lot of questions um, around it. So I do have some resources at the end of this um, as well. So um, I added the licensing guide from April of 2022. So if you want some uh, light reading from Microsoft, it's like 60 some pages of, of licensing uh, information all around all of the Dynamics uh, products. Uh, you can absolutely look at that. Um, I have a, a YouTube video that goes through and explains this um, uh, in, a, in a 10 or 15 minute uh, overview as well. So if you want a more focused approach to that, you can absolutely look at that as well. Uh, and then I have a number of other resources um, that are um, uh, available on my blog or on the FastPath website. So with that, I will go ahead and 
put my uh, question slide up here. My contact information is going to be here as well. Um, the PowerPoint that I went through today is available um, on my website as well, and I'm sure uh, Raz will have it on the uh, Power Community site. Um, but at this point, um, we can start going through any questions. I'll kind of read back through here. But if um, there's anybody that would like to um, uh, raise their hand, uh, we can absolutely start asking for uh, for questions here. All right, so team, sorry, I'm just reading through some of these. Yeah, the, the again, the licensing audit that Microsoft um, can do, especially uh, it may not be as prevalent in Dynamics currently as it is in other products the, uh, that Microsoft offers, but they absolutely have the data now to actually go out and do that. Um, and so I, it's something that you want to get ahead of and not be behind for sure on actually going through that. Um, yep, Frank is a good point. They have all the telemetry data now, so they can do that analysis. Um, CE and agree with FNO. Ooh, Paul, that's a great point. So if you build, um, his question is, do you, if you build purchase order functionality in D35CE and integrate it with D35FNO, do the CE users still need FNO licenses? Um, so if I'm understanding the question correctly, if you have a CE integration in your, uh, within FNO, I believe is the way that you're uh, in uh, function CE and integrated. Oh, OK, so you're saying coming from CE going to FNO. All right, sorry, I, I misread the question first. So um, if you have an outside integration and the way that Microsoft kind of treats all of this, an outside integration that is going to hit a particular uh, um, inst or a particular area within FNO, uh, the way that Microsoft handles that is that if it's as if that integration is performing that task in the user interface. So what license would it be required to have to create a purchase order within FNO, right? And that's what those licenses are. That's what those users need uh, to perform. So um, yeah, it gets a little bit hairy with external integrations and especially when you start um, talking about, uh, um, you know, uh, going cross app and things like that. But as far as I know, that's the way that they uh, look at it is as if you, it's as if that that uh, integration or external user or whatever were performing that task in FNO. Why, what license would they be required to have? Yeah. So, um, and I uh, that was uh, brought up in the the response there. Um, yep, yeah, Frank. Another good question about segregation duties across those um, those systems as well, right? Um, and and the the risk that's imposed there, not just from a str um, straight licensing perspective, but also from a, um, a risk perspective um, within your organization. <laughs> uh, Land, that's a great question. Are there other reports similar to the user license estimator report um, that would actually give you numbers instead of green dots? Uh, that is a that is a question I get quite often as well. Uh, Natively within FNO, there is not. Uh, again, I uh, I work um, and develop reports that do. I know um, uh, there are enhancements uh, going into the user license estimator report uh, because of the feedback from customers. I don't. Um, I can't give any specifics uh, because uh, I. I not a Microsoft employee, but I can't tell you when those are going in, but I know that there are things to um, address some of the um, gaps and, and things like that that exist currently. Um, but currently, uh, and there, I don't believe there is a report, or I don't know of one that shows the actual numbers instead of the, the green dots for the user license estimator. All right, going back through check with that um, if there's anybody else that would uh, has a question if they want to put it in the chat or raise their hand um, happy to answer that if not uh, Raz I, th I think I can um, I hand this back um, and give some t some time back um, for our next uh, presentation thank you Alex uh, 
thank you for that uh, very um very very concise session um you've had, you've answered so many questions uh, and you've actually really educated people from scratch really uh, around security and around licenses so huge 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 applause for Alex, uh, thank you so much. Your sessions are always fantastic and uh, they seem to get, always get better and better. So, yeah, huge round of applause for Alex there. Um, so, Alex, Thanks, yes, so we, we, we will let you go then, Alex, uh, because I know you're a busy man. Um, so, yeah, definitely. Uh, and we will move over to the next session as we're getting towards the end of the day now. Um, so I will get your slides uploaded. Uh, so once again, thank you, Alex. Um, so that was Alex. So Alex, um, uh, yep. So make sure you follow Alex uh, on LinkedIn, Twitter, and uh, follow his blog. Um, and um, we will now actually introduce our next uh, speaker.